Hey, Cypher here. I wanted to go back and watch some classics and know plenty about the oil boom in California, which I've got an episode on it already. So I thought I'd try There Will Be Blood. The movie was released in 2007, and I don't think I've seen it since before I switched majors to history. So I was surprised with all the references. Now it's a fictional film, but you can really dig deeper into the references and hit some pay dirt. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do here, explain how rich this film is in historical detail. Since it's fiction, unlike an actual based on a true story, that means I'm going to spoil the film. So you've been warned. The film adapts the 1927 Umpton Sinclair book, Oil. Sinclair is best known for his muckraking journalism and his 1905 meat industry expose called The Jungle. This book itself was fictional, but a real-life event inspired it. In 1923, a scandal exploded, showing the extreme corruption in the Harding administration. That resulted from a long convoluted series of events that culminated in a couple of congressional investigations, a bunch of prosecutions, and one administrator spending time in prison. Even before Warren G. Harding took office, he sold out cabinet positions. His first choice for the Secretary of the Interior, Jake Hammond, was an oil baron who bribed his way into the position. But he got murdered by his mistress before he could take the position. Instead, that went to Senator Albert Bacon Fall. He'd had a long and nasty career in politics, having survived a couple shootouts in the 1890s. His first rival went missing on the white sands of New Mexico, and Fall successfully defended the accused perpetrator. He'd also successfully defend the person accused of murdering Pat Garrett, another rival due to rampant cattle theft. He cozied up to the Santa Fe Rings leader, Thomas Catron, and they both became New Mexico's first senators after statehood. As a senator, leading the Foreign Affairs Committee, he'd campaign for invading Mexico in 1919, partially because he secretly co-owned some oil claims there, and the chaos of the revolution threatened that. Fall plays a prominent role in my dissertation, if you couldn't tell. So I'll squeeze that in with the bibliography. Once Harding gave him the cabinet position, he easily fit in with the rest of what would become known as the Ohio Gang. The Harding administration was basically infested with ne'er-do-wells, many of whom were friends from his home state of Ohio, hence the gang's name. They used all kinds of nefarious ways to extract money from the government and redirect it into their own pockets. Harding regularly left the White House for drunken debauchery and sexual liaisons, so it's possible he was unaware of most of this criminal fraud, but there's really no way he could have avoided all of it. The head of the gang was U.S. Attorney General Harry M. Doherty, who basically kept a tight leash on all of its members. Fall was essentially a yes-man to him. New oil millionaires were taking advantage of the administration. In 1911, the Supreme Court ruled that Standard Oil had monopolized the market and that it had to be broken up into numerous constituent companies. This left room for other corporations to expand into the vacuum left behind, which came just in time for several major oil fields to start paying out. Two presidents of these oil ventures were close to the administration. One was Harry Ford Sinclair, who simply went by Cinco, and owned a lot of rigs from Oklahoma and up through the Midwest. Then there was Edward L. Doheny, who pioneered the Los Angeles oil fields. The U.S. Navy kept several known deposits as reserves, but Doheny and Cinco wanted to drill them anyways. So they hatched a scheme to use the rampant corruption of the Harding administration to their advantage. Doheny gave Fall a loan of $100,000 to ostensibly pay for his purchase of more ranch land in New Mexico. But really, that was a bribe to place the oil reserves in their hands. With that, Fall worked out several transfers. Cinco got Teapot Dome in Wyoming, Doheny got the Elk Hills in California, and there were a few other transfers. Almost immediately, newspapers started reporting on this as a serious breach. The Albuquerque Journal was particularly vociferous. But Fall managed to pay off both its owners. Nonetheless, Senator Fighting Bob La Follette launched an investigation which eventually revealed all of this wrongdoing. But Harding died before he could receive much blame. Several lawsuits and criminal prosecutions resulted. 
most of the conspirators escaped punishment, though Fall was imprisoned for a year and thoroughly disgraced. Cinco appears to have gotten through all this without a scrape, but Doheny was beset with legal issues that made him become a recluse. That's why he's the primary inspiration for Daniel Plainview, the main character of There Will Be Blood. Much like Doheny, Plainview begins by mining for oil in California. They even mention the Antelope Hills. And two others drilling, and I have 16 producing at Antelope, so... Which are the naval reserves that Doheny, in real life, temporarily gained control of during the Harding administration. And Plainview ends up lonely and troubled, just like his counterpart. The famous line about the milkshake? I drink your milkshake! <laughs> That's supposedly a quote from Fall, according to the director, but I couldn't find it in the congressional record or reference to it anywhere else. Nonetheless, the movie is a pretty obvious parallel. It draws on many other oil scandals, particularly Californian ones. C.C. Julian was a notorious swindler in the L.A. oil boom throughout the 1920s. His petroleum company, simply called Julian Pete, typified the dog-eat-dog -dog world of oilmen. A standard scheme of his was going after investors in order to start a new well that would purposefully fail to dig sufficiently to produce. In 1925, Julian sold his company, but not without having issued millions of bogus stocks onto the market. This caused a minor crash, but Julian did the same in Oklahoma before he fled to China and killed himself in 1934. This speaks to the film's repeated references to the nasty business Plainview engaged in. He adopts a fallen worker's son as his own. Often using the kid as a sales strategy. I'm a family man. I run a family business. This is my son and my partner, H.W. Plainview. Oh, it's just me and my son now but furiously burns that bridge when the grown man wants to make his own way in the world. You don't mean it. What's the truth? You're not my son. You never have been. You're no... You're no... Orphan. Look at me! You're lower than a bastard. The way he swindles locals out of valuable property by lowering their estimation of yield and speaking of his patronage is classic C.C. Julian. Uh, so do you want to find someone else that's going to come up here and drill, Eli? Make the investment and do all the hard work that goes into it? I can just as easily hunt for quail on another ranch. You're going to have more grain than you know what to do with. New roads, agriculture, employment. These are just a few of the things we can offer you. And this community of yours will not only survive, it will flourish. He's an oil man, and ruthlessness is simply how one survived in that business. Something that truly great historical works do, including fictional films, is that they speak to larger circumstances of the present. There's been a recent uproar in the history profession about what one historian called presentism, but any honest historian will admit that we write history for the present. And honestly, the profession really despised that blog post. No work can transcend the time it's written in. My dissertation, which is ostensibly about American violence throughout the Southwest during the frontier period, and yes, that includes early 20th century California, when the movie depicts, has a prologue and epilogue that are purely about how we can apply this understanding of violence as symbol to the mass shooting epidemic plaguing America today. So something I love about this film is how it does the same. All the cinema tube essayists have made videos talking about the religious implications of There Will Be Blood, but frankly, they've only provided a surface understanding because they refuse to drill into historical meaning. Most point out the obvious symbolism of oil being blood, yet somehow completely miss the point that this movie came out in 2007, which necessitates a deep correlation. Trying to make this movie about universal and timeless themes robs it of meaning. There's two themes that this interpretation entirely ignores. That's global warming and the Iraq War. Yes, those things are ultimately what this movie is about. So firstly, for those who are unaware, yes, the movie makes the link between blood and oil rather explicit. I know you 
didn't get on with their father. But that message means something different now than when this movie came out, and appreciating that context can add so much more depth to its meaning. Let's start with the environmentalist part. In a way, you could think of drilling for oil as leaching the blood of Mother Earth from her. This is made even more significant when considering the historical setting of the film. At one point, they survey a pipeline from the San Joaquin Valley to San Luis Obispo. This is San Luis Obispo County land. My birthplace, by the way. He kills his fake brother somewhere near the very same hills that held so many lynch victims as a chapter in my dissertation covers. One county south of that was one of the worst oil spills in 1969. The following year, this disaster spurred on the creation of an event to raise awareness of ecological problems, called Earth Day. This is often seen as the beginning of the modern environmental movement, the key issue of which in 2007, as well as today, was global warming, which is of course caused by humanity burning fossil fuels, the very thing the movie's about. Just one year before There Will Be Blood released, the issue of global warming became particularly propagandized with Al Gore's film An Inconvenient Truth. The issue had been well recognized by climatologists for decades. One of my favorite historians, James Burke, had even made a TV special called After the Warming about the history of climate change and the impending disaster of global warming in 1989. So Gore was not really saying anything new, but an inconvenient truth made the public aware of the issue more than the dire warnings of experts, and it sparked much controversy. By the way, Emperor Tigerstar and I have been watching a bunch of propaganda films live on Twitch Whee! to turn into a big episode here about the evolution of propaganda as an art form. We just watched Bowling for Columbine. We're about to watch An Inconvenient Truth. We just saw how Michael Moore kind of invented a new genre of propaganda where it was uh, this kind of like zany documentary and we were kind of pointing out that it was weird and bad, but it was the beginning of something. We're going to see a little bit of a change with this movie. It's interesting how many of the talking points he's using here have basically been adopted as like standard talking points when talking about global warming. You know, like the, hey, let's talk about the hole in the ozone layer and how like we managed to fix that. As far as I know, he's kind of the one who created those talking points with this vi with this movie he took it serially i'm here to educate you about the single biggest threat to our planet man bear pig and he most certainly exists i'm serial much 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 later oh is it inconvenient now I tried to warn you all, but no one took me serial. So you were right about Member Pig signed picture. We the just episode. ruminate on how South Park ruined a generation of discourse. <laughs> Both sides are equally bad. And you take an issue too seriously, therefore I'm not going to take it seriously. Yeah, I love South Park, but there's definitely that whole... <laughs> you so, didn't South talk about, like, the other side, though. South Park is that relative that you have good memories with, but they're kind of a shitty person, and you're kind of reconciling with that. Okay, I think uh, this is going to be back to Al Gore ASMR. I don't think we need to see any more of that, right? No, yeah. Um, so, in terms of that movie, what does that mean for like how propaganda has evolved? It was just kind of a lecture. If we compare it to like Michael Moore's, you could argue that this is the transition from a classic style to a more gotcha type style or whatever you'd want to call it. Like Al Gore is the generation before Michael Moore. And so you could see that as like, oh, here's the last gasp of the old style and the first breath of the new style. Ah. So be sure to come check out my Twitch channel at some point. Anyways, with There Will Be Blood coming out on the heels of all that, and explicitly connecting blood and oil, it was very much a movie of its present, despite depicting the past. With all of that added context, you can read this film as an allegory for taking the Earth's blood and abusing that power for profit, creating a depressingly inevitable cycle of destruction. Then there were contemporary events that a similar allegory could be identified with. Throughout 2007, President Bush increased the number of troops sent to the ongoing Iraq War by 40,000. 
This surge was a significant change in the war and largely seen as a success in hindsight, but when the movie came out, that was not apparent. Critics of the war often charge it with being one primarily for oil. This is an oversimplification, which I have covered in a previous episode, but American interest in oil certainly drove continued and rather foolish involvement in Iraqi affairs. Either way, given the movie's release date, it could be seen as a critique of the war, hence the senseless violence. But there's one subject I've purposefully avoided thus far. There's all this stuff about Christianity in the film. The title itself is a Bible quote from Exodus. The full passage says, So the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, canals, ponds, and all their water reservoirs, and they will become blood. There will be blood throughout the land of Egypt, even in wooden and stone containers. Quite the portentous promise God is making there. And of course, this is referring to one of the plagues of Egypt. The movie itself is making its own promise with that title. Even the poster shows a cross on a derrick. We see the baby get anointed with oil early in this film. So what's going on here? The movie takes place during the end of what historians call the Third Great Awakening. After the Civil War, Americans sought old-time religion to cope with their losses after such a bloody conflict, the most devastating in our history. Much like the previous Awakenings, this took many forms. Some turned to spiritualism, like many Unitarians after the war, who used esoteric ceremonies to remedy their suffering through things like seances and faith healing, that ultimately disintegrated the prominence Unitarians held before the war. Other Christians turned to the holiness movement, which focused on freeing oneself of sin in everyday life. They began tent revival evangelism in 1867 and continued for decades. They started incorporating some of the spiritualism from liberal Christianity, which morphed into Pentecostalism. That taught that speaking in tongues was another act of grace, much like baptism and holiness before it. Significantly, the movement started gaining popularity with a revival on Los Angeles' Azusa Street in 1906 through 1915. So the preacher in this film, Eli, is clearly referencing the rise of Pentecostalism in California. We see him speaking in tongues, acts as a charismatic leader, although fails miserably, and even baptizes Plainview while demanding he openly renounce his sins. Say it louder! I've abandoned my child! I've abandoned my child! I love this part where he chases the cameraman out of the church. <laughs> as though we the audience are Satan getting banished. All that is clear references to revivals, holiness, and Pentecostalism. But the movie does something deeper with this than merely referencing the Third Great Awakening. In order to explore that, we have to discuss a philosopher's theory from the time first. In 1905, Max Weber released a book titled The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. It argued that the work ethic derived from Calvinism was what made capitalism possible. This strain of Protestantism emphasizes that grace, as in whether God has chosen someone to join him in heaven, was likely shown when work gained success. So Protestants learned to work hard and prosper. Eventually, they accrued enough wealth that they could invest it and gather more. This is what defined capitalism for Weber, the accumulation of capital for its own sake. The movie appears to be commenting on the spirit of capitalism, saying that it is fundamentally corrupting. You can see this in how Plainview appears to genuinely love his adopted son, H.W. But when the well gushes and knocks the boy deaf, he chooses to save the oil once it catches fire, rather than console H.W. They become more and more distant with each other since they can no longer communicate effectively. When the fake brother shows up, H.W. learns of the deceit before his father and tries to burn the man. This happens just as Plainview admits, I've built up my hatreds over the years, little by little. This fake brother was here to leach off of his wealth. <laughs> Somebody please. <laughs> <laughs> 
revealing how the allure of capital spreads its corruption to others. Then there is the ultimate form of community, at least in the perspective of this movie, which is religion. Eli is clearly using Pentecostalism as a means to gain prestige. And then you could say, the proud son of these hills who tended his father's flock. And then you could say my name. He seeks riches off of Plainview's success, but gets stiffed multiple times. One goddamn hell of a show. We were happy to have you, Daniel. By the end of the film, Eli is begging Plainview for money. Much like Eli had made him confess his sins, now Plainview makes Eli confess that he's a charlatan. I am a false prophet! God is a superstition! And in a symbolic fight that follows, the oil man kills the preacher. The spirit of capitalism corrupted the Protestant ethic. I am the third revelation! I am the third revelation! I that third revelation he's referring to is the third work of grace from Pentecostalism. He's replaced speaking in tongues with shrewd business acumen. The history of religion makes this movie that much better if you pay attention. Now there's plenty more to analyze here, like why is the dialogue so awkward? When people are talking in this movie, their lines seem unrehearsed and clumsy, but this also seems purposeful and somehow still entertaining. Or the music is always signaling that something dreadful or portentous is about to happen, especially before scenes of mundane work or interactions. Is that just stylistic, or is it supposed to be meaningful? Plus, did you notice that there's some really queer undertones in this movie? Gotta be something there. A gay friend of mine loves this movie specifically because of that. So yeah, there's much more to analyze. But I hope I've shown that understanding the history this movie depicts considerably amplifies one's appreciation of it. Knowing about the Teapot Dome scandal, C.C. Julian, Third Great Awakening, and Weber allows you to better analyze it. Connecting it to contemporary events shows the deeper meaning of the film. This is a form of critique called New Historicism. It allows you to understand a creation without having to believe the artist at face value. Death of the Author is about how meaning is not rooted in expressed intent. Rather, once the creation is out there, the public interprets it. That's why I haven't really talked about the director during this review, who was Paul Thomas Anderson if you were wondering. New historicism is how that interpretation is rooted in the zeitgeist. So with all of this theory, context, and analysis, there's a question the film asks its viewers, and now you guys can answer yourselves. Can community, nature, and peace exist for an extended time under capitalism? Now, now what? Now what? You're stuck. You're stuck. <laughs> hey. ah! Mom. Ah! What? You want to stay here? I'm trying to put you up on the bookshelf. There you go. Come on. Come on.